Hello everyone. Thank you for attending our webinar series here at Micromoritics. Our topic for today is powder flow characterization for optimizing processes in industry and research. My name is Julian Hungerford, and today I'm going to be a moderator for today's talk. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools you can use. All the engagement tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A engagement tool. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, it will be answered later via email. Please note, we do capture all questions. A copy of today's slide deck and additional help materials are available in the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or links that you may find help useful. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. Webinars are bandwidth intensive, so closing any unnecessary browser tabs will help conserve our bandwidth. The webcast is being streamed through your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so that you can hear the presenters. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is recommended. If your slides are behind, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the Help Engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker today, Guy Stimson. Dr. Guy Stimson is an application scientist for Freeman Technology, a micromeritics company based in the UK. Guy studied a bachelor's degree in astrophysics at Private School Aberystwyth University before completing a PhD in experimental quantum physics at Warwick University, where he studied the use of optically detected magnetic resonance of nitrogen vacancies in nano diamond for magnetometry and quantum sensing. Guy works closely with researchers and engineers from across industry to develop and implement methodologies for the testing of powder flow systems, bringing advanced powder testing into new markets and novel applications in order to improve efficiency and maximize industrial throughput. Once again, let us thank our speaker, Guy Stimson, and I will go ahead and pass it off to him. Hello, I'm Dr. Guy Stimson, an application scientist for Freeman Technology, a micromeritics company based in the UK. Today, I'm going to talk to you about powder flow characterization for optimizing processes in industry and research. Powders are used across many, many different industries in many different processes to make thousands, millions of different products. Some of those industries include construction, pigments, paints and coatings, additive manufacturing, food, electric vehicles and battery technology, cosmetics, bulk chemicals and pharmaceuticals. Each of these different industries has different requirements for its powders and each of the different processes within that industry introduce different constraints on what the behaviour of the powder should be and how that powder is handled. We might ask ourselves, why use powders at all? Well, powders can have a large number of advantages over competing forms of material. They can be easy to transport. We can carry powders in all kinds of containers, allowing us to optimize space for efficient shipping. Powders are stable. We can be confident that when traveling long distances or being subject to diverse processes, our powders will be in the same condition as when we started. They are flexible. As we've seen, powders can be used across a limitless range of processes and industries. They are mixable. We can easily take two or more different chemical compounds in powder form and mix them together to create something new, often without triggering chemical reactions which might be undesirable at the point of mixing. Powders are controllable. Dosing, mass uniformity and product consistency can all be enhanced by the effective use of industrial powders. Finally, they are manageable. Whether as raw materials, process chemicals, or final products, powders are usually easy to handle, even by untrained personnel. However, powders are not always as convenient as we might hope. 
they are not always easy to transport, as their flow properties can be completely changed as they are affected by movement and vibration as they travel. This means that they are not always stable, being subject to consolidation, deaeration, segregation and caking. Powders are not always flexible. In many cases, a powder which works well in one process may present significant challenges downstream, leading to trade-offs in performance and, ultimately, stoppages and downtime, costing plants valuable resources in time and materials. Powders are not always easily mixable, even when the components are easy to handle. Interactions between particles of different ingredients can lead to inhomogeneities in complex mixtures. They are not always controllable. In fact, dosing, mass uniformity and product-to-product -product weight variation are some of the most widespread powder handling issues across industry. Finally, they are not always manageable. Even as solid materials, powders can pose significant handling risks, both to processors and end users. Ultimately, powders are their own contradiction, and understanding this contradiction is essential if we are to effectively and efficiently leverage powders for our industrial and research purposes. But why are powders so challenging? Well, we've seen how they are used across diverse industries, processes and applications, so perhaps it's not reasonable for us to expect consistent behaviour when we are asking so much. Aside from that, we also need to realise that even where similar powders are used in similar processes, there may be small differences from plant to plant which can have a significant effect on the flow behaviour of our materials. We also need to consider the environment. What are the materials of our process equipment? What forces are we subjecting our powders to? And what physical and chemical changes are we imposing on them? Each of these factors ultimately affects how powder flows and the effects that flow has on process. Finally, powders are hugely diverse in themselves. Their particles vary in size, shape, surface texture and porosity, for example. Here we can see a single particle of some imaginary powder. It looks nicely spherical and very smooth, so we could expect that a powder made up of such particles may behave comparatively favourably. However, we are rarely so fortunate. Particle surfaces may be rough and undergo frictional interactions or they may be irregularly shaped. They may have strong electronic surface forces or undergo electrostatic charging, or moisture and liquid bridging could play a role in their behaviour. Particles may also be subject to deformation, either breaking apart entirely or changing shape plastically or elastically. This can lead to challenges when handling our powders, particularly where strong mechanical forces are present. We even face challenges before powders arrive at our plants and factories. Most powders will undergo some kind of travel, either local or global, in between their place of origin and their final destination. For example, let's say we have some cornstarch, which originates in South America, where at the time of manufacture, the weather is hot and humid. After a long sea voyage, the cornstarch may be destined for a factory in Norway where it arrives in the winter months amid freezing temperatures and a markedly different level of relative humidity. Knowing that powder flow is subject to changes in environmental conditions, we can't expect the behaviour at source to closely resemble that at our destination. Even if both the source and the destination are in similar climates, or if the powder is to be used in climate controlled facilities, we still have to consider what happens to our powder on its long journey. Whether transported by sea, air, road or rail, powders usually undergo numerous changes in environmental conditions, not to mention extended and intense periods of knocking, tapping and general vibration. Here we have another sample of an imaginary powder. As you can see, the particles are of uniform size, they have smooth surfaces and they are perfectly spherical. So again, we might expect simple, predictable behaviour from such a powder. All we're going to do is pour the powder from one vessel into another. As we do so, we can see that as it falls, the powder entrains air, which is mixed in between the particles, and the volume taken up by the powder in the second vessel has now increased. When we pour the powder again, we can see that it flows much more readily. Now, if we tap or vibrate the powder, we can see that air is released and the powder consolidates.
Then when we pour the powder again, we can see greatly reduced flow or even no flow at all. What's important to realize is that there have been no physical or chemical changes happening to the powder. All that has taken place is some very ordinary handling. This shows that regardless of the many complexities that we've seen so far, simple, trivial behaviours still have a pronounced effect on powder flow. When we think about all of the factors we have discussed, it's easy to see how powders can make a complex manufacturing process into a challenging problem when we are trying to optimise efficiency and efficacy. In the example here, we have a fairly common tableting process. This could be used to make pharmaceutical medicines, detergent tablets or other chemical products, but the elements making up the overall process can be similar. Each of the stages in this manufacturing process can impose different requirements on the powders used, and also the powder itself may change in character several times between the beginning and end of the process. There may also be multiple powders used, as well as liquids, which might be introduced as either active ingredients or as binders to modify the behaviour of the powders. Here, powder is stored in a hopper, which may contain tens to hundreds of kilograms of material, which presses down on the powder at its base. This means that the compressibility and cohesiveness of the powders are of prime importance, but high permeability is also an important requirement in that air needs to be able to backflow through the powder in order to dislodge material and keep the hopper discharge consistent. However, in the next step, if we're relying on pneumatic conveyance, we may experience trouble because the high permeability of the powder that we needed for good hopper flow is now working against us, with low permeability powders often being favoured in pneumatically driven processes. Similarly, in the granulation step, we may require a level of cohesion which was counterproductive in our hopper. Alternatively, we might add a liquid binder at this point, which can bring our powder particles together to make granules which improve flow reducing dusting and aiding us in achieving the correct dosage in our tablets. These granules then need to pass through a number of different sub-processes, after which they may undergo a number of chemical and physical changes and be dependent on various different properties. This shows us that we cannot simply measure a powder at the beginning of a process, or even a single stage within the process, if we want to get the best out of our system. Instead, we need to examine the process at various points and use this information to develop multi-level understanding of powder behaviour. Later this year, I hope to return to tablet making in a subsequent webinar, where I'll examine some of the specific challenges involved and look at how to combine information from multiple areas to optimise the overall process. So look out for updates and I hope you'll join me then. We saw earlier how the packing state of particles can have a significant influence on the flow behaviour of our powder. We like to refer to this in terms of the stress incident on the particles. Under low stress conditions, such as aerated and fluidised states, particles can move freely and only interact weakly. Under high stress conditions, by contrast, the powder particles are packed in tightly together, interacting strongly and unable to move independently. Again, this is unrelated to the chemical and physical properties of individual particles, but emerges simply as a result of powder handling and the environmental conditions. Here we can see a number of different examples of applications where we might encounter the different stress conditions. Each of these applications, because of its nature, imparts a particular set of demands on the powders, with different powder and particle properties being desirable or undesirable, depending on the particular flow requirements. Firstly, we have hoppers, where large quantities of material lead to high stress conditions. However, due to and despite often huge volumes of material, gravitational influence only leads to comparatively low flow rates, with the material inside the main body of the hopper behaving almost like a static material until the moment of discharge. Then we have a filling shoe, as might be found in a tablet making process, like the one we saw earlier. Here, the quantities of material are much lower, resulting in lower stresses acting on the particles. Gravity is still the main driver of particle motion, but because of the reciprocal motion of the shoe, this is a much more dynamic environment. We also have transport and storage, which have been alluded to a few times already. Whilst we might not initially consider this a process at first glance, particles are still moving with respect to one another, albeit often at extremely low rates.
Vibrations can lead to deaeration and consolidation, whilst interaction with moisture can lead to reversible or irreversible caking in some materials. Lastly, we have extremely low stress conditions, like those found, for example, in dry powder inhalers for treating medical conditions such as asthma. Here, powder particles must mix well with the pressurised gases in order to be delivered efficiently upon the airstream at high flow rates. We can see from these examples that even if we were to be using the same powder in each of these processes, the flow behaviour of the powder would necessarily be different in each case. With this in mind, we have to be certain that we not only match powders to the appropriate process conditions, but also that we apply our powder flow testing in a way which relates the correct test procedures to the appropriate working conditions. Now that we've seen the challenges which face us in powder flow, it's time we turn to some of the measurement systems we can deploy in our attempt to understand and categorise flow behaviour. Traditionally, Powder measurement methods have focused on fast, easy to perform measurements, which can be interpreted simply. Here, we'll take a look at some of these traditional methods and try to understand why they might not be sufficient to investigate the complexity of modern powder processing requirements. First, we have the angle of repose measurement, where a small amount of powder is poured out onto a platform and the angle at which the mound of powder lies is measured. This angle can then be used to estimate the powder's flowability. So far, so easy. However, this method suffers from a number of drawbacks. Firstly, different users are likely to prepare their samples in slightly different ways. Some users might pour the powder from a different height, for example, or one user might accidentally vibrate the sample in their hands prior to making their measurement, leading to consolidation of the powder and a changed sample before the measurement even begins. The precision of the measurement is also comparatively low, with manual measurements of the angle often relied upon, with the well-known ineffectiveness of human judgment causing a large degree of error. This also raises the point, which angle to measure? All six of the powders in this image are the same powder. Which one is correct? This one or this one? Even when considering just one of these cones of powder, where on the cone are we to take our measurement? Here? Here? Or how about here? These questions render this approach liable to large amounts of judgment and estimation, which in turn lead to poor precision, poor repeatability and poor differentiation between similar but not identical samples. In a modern science-driven world, we need more reliable data sets if we are to understand what is a complex problem. Next, we have the tapped density measurement, which is still widely used across industry. Although this method is able to achieve improvements on the angle of repose measurement that we just saw, it still suffers from many of the same drawbacks. In this measurement, a known volume of powder is subjected to a series of applied taps or knocks. These taps should be of a consistent energy and amplitude, so the change in sample volume and density should be repeatable for a given number of taps. However, once again, samples may be prepared in different ways, or have different storage histories, and so differences in the initial packing state can determine how much consolidation occurs once the measurement begins. Tapping instruments may also differ from unit to unit or manufacturer to manufacturer. This means that a certain density change may be observed in one location and a different density change measured elsewhere, even when the powders are identical and are prepared in an identical manner. Finally, this measurement by itself isn't particularly sensitive, with the most susceptible powders only seeing up to around a 40% change in their density at maximum. This means that even powders with quite different characteristics may not be differentiated by this method, let alone powders with similar particle properties. Another method in frequent use is the flow through an orifice or hall flow method. In this setup, powder is placed into a chamber and then allowed to flow through a funnel and the rate of flow is measured. Once again though, we see the same limitations. Variations in sample preparation and the resulting packing state lead to poor repeatability and reproducibility. Additionally, certain powders may not even flow at all, so this method may produce no results.
More recently, efforts have been directed towards more rigorous measurement with solid underlying mathematical principles. Perhaps the most significant step forward in this regard was the development of shear cell testing. This methodology employs bodies of powder moving across one another in order to simulate the onset of flow. While several variations on this technology are in use around the world, all rely on the same foundational principles, and all are highly repeatable. Moreover, they are much less susceptible to user influence, as in most cases, the powder is compacted such that any pre-existing packing state becomes irrelevant. The robustness of the shear cell method is evidenced by their adoption across the powder processing community. However, shear cells are only a solution to a part of the problem, as they are only a good simulation of powder in high stress conditions, such as those found in hoppers and silos. Moderate to low stress and dynamic systems cannot be accurately represented, and extreme low stress environments do not even rely on the same forces. So hoppers may be in, but big bags, shoe filling and asthma inhalers are out, as are the majority of powder process operations. Another tool is necessary for these more diverse conditions. Enter powder rheology. This modern approach to powder testing is able to dramatically improve on the lack of repeatability and reproducibility of traditional methods, whilst also being able to model the diverse conditions that are not available to shear cell methods. User influence effects can be mitigated by the use of careful powder conditioning, which removes packing state effects and leaves samples in a homogeneous, repeatable condition prior to measurements being made. Like shear cells, powder rheology is becoming widely adopted across the powder community, with industries ranging from food and pharma to additive manufacturing and nuclear engineering using powder rheology to characterise their materials. Unlike shear cells, the rheological approach allows us to apply the correct testing regimes, dependent on the particular process we're investigating. Along with the user configurability of most good powderiometers, this means that even unique process conditions can be matched in the test, removing the need for extrapolation and guesswork when applying data to real-world practices. The FT4 powderiometer shown here also combines a fully effective shear cell, so that along with bulk and dynamic testing regimes, high-stress measurements can all be taken all in one place. Hoppers are in, big bags and IBCs are in, filling shoes and rapid processing systems are in, and the ultra-low stress, high flow rate environments of dry powder inhalers, fluidized beds and spray coating applications are all measurable with powder rheology. As mentioned, the repeatability of powder rheology measurement is, in part, due to the ability to mitigate the effects of differences in particle packing state. Where some powders may experience pre-consolidation during sample preparation, others may be subject to agglomeration or over-aeration, with pockets of air and other inhomogeneities preventing testing from producing consistent results. Here we can see that the gentle slicing of the blade, made possible here by the particular blade shape, allows the powder to flow smoothly over the blade and to fall into a loosely packed and homogeneous state. This conditioning is entirely user configurable, so that for powders which might be subject to high levels of attrition, for example, conditioning can be reduced or made more gentle. Contrastingly, for powders which are more subject to agglomeration or other inhomogeneities, the number of conditioning cycles can be increased, or the conditioning made more intense. By monitoring the results of the conditioning cycle, users can configure the precise level of conditioning which is required for a given powder. The suite of tests available to powder rheometry is almost limitless, but as standard, three categories of testing are performed which provide a strong overview of a given sample's flow properties. Dynamic testing allows us to investigate the range of condition in which powders are under high levels of motion and to examine a number of different flow regimes. Bulk testing, meanwhile, gives us an understanding of powders in a static state or when under exterior stresses across a range of regimes. By combining bulk and dynamic results, a rich data set with high quality information regarding not only powder flow, but particle-particle interaction can also be obtained. Lastly, shear cell testing allows for the investigation of the transition between static and dynamic behaviour at the highest of stress conditions.
This completes the set of testing conditions, allowing access to the entire spectrum of powder flow conditions. By utilizing the appropriate tests relevant to a particular set of conditions, all powder flow phenomena can be probed. Dynamic testing relies upon the ability to reproduce flow conditions inside the testing chamber, avoiding the pitfalls of simulation by analogy. Derived and inferred values can be avoided in favour of direct measurements, which are taken simultaneously as real flow conditions are mimicked. The mechanical action of the blade produces the flow environment, whilst the blade simultaneously measures the physical resistance to its passage. When measuring the conditions inside confined areas such as tubes, pipes and containers, the blade is employed in an aggressive flow pattern, causing the powder to flow in front of itself. As it causes the rotation of the whole powder column, the blade is measuring both vertical force and rotational torque, i.e. the resistance to the blade's motion. These values can then be combined and integrated as a function of height to provide a flow energy value. This particular methodology is most applicable to moderate stress regimes in confined or constrained conditions. By contrast, for unconfined conditions, such as those found in pouring and filling applications, we can instead turn to the specific energy, or SE. This is a measurement of the particle's propensity for mechanical interlocking and friction, with high SE powders being able to form complex structures which lead to intermittent flow and the high likelihood of trapped air in the powder bed. In this video, we can see the intermittent flow of this detergent powder over the rear edge of the blade as it is withdrawn from the powder sample. As mentioned, dynamic testing can also investigate low and ultra-low stress regimes by examining the flow behaviour of aerated and fluidised powder materials. In essence, this test procedure is able to compare the strength of attractive interparticular forces with gravity by using a directed airflow to encourage powder particles to separate. Where these interparticular forces are weak, the forces imparted by the airflow cause this separation of particles to occur readily, and air is able to pass easily through the powder sample. This means that when the blade travels through the powder, it encounters very low torque and vertical force resistance, as seen in the example video here, which shows a ceramic powder which exhibits low cohesion in this low stress environment. By contrast, powders whose particles experience strong attractive forces are not able to readily separate, and so the particles remain clumped together and air is only able to pass through narrow channels and corridors, instead of in between individual particles. This means that the blade encounters strong resistance to its passage, much more akin to the unaerated state. This aeration test then is a good measurement of low stress cohesion, and it's important that we draw a distinction between the types of cohesion experienced in these different stress regimes. We can now move on to the other end of the scale, where shear cell testing can probe the higher stress environments inside hoppers and silos. As with all testing, the sample should first be conditioned to remove agglomerates and any other inhomogeneities. The powder can then be pre-compacted. This must be done to prevent the onset of flow occurring as a result of unexpected weaknesses in the powder bed. This pre-compaction is always performed at a greater stress level than any that is to be encountered during the testing phase, so that any such weaknesses are broken during the pre-compaction, rather than during the test. In this sped up video, we can see that the compaction is performed before the sample excess is removed and the powder bed leveled. This means that our compacted sample will be of known volume and consistent packing state. The shear head can then be fitted and is forced into the powder bed. Note the fine teeth protruding from the shear head. Powder particles fill the space in between these teeth, forming two distinct disks of powder, one at the top, which will be rotated by the shear head, and the other beneath, which will remain static throughout the test. The shear head then rotates, and the stress measured as a result of this rotation. The degree of this stress is what allows us to determine the high stress flowability or flow function of the powder. 
we are also able to measure high stress cohesion, a useful value which is a byproduct of the shear cell test. And these values together give us an excellent understanding of hopper discharge behavior, particularly when combined with wall friction measurements, which can also be performed in a similar manner. We now have an understanding of the different stress regimes across process to which our powders may be exposed. We've seen ultra low stresses, such as those which are found in aeration and fluidization operations, such as spray drying and spray coating, filling, dosing, mixing and segregation. We've seen testing which can investigate filling, packing and dosing, as well as more moderate stress environments, such as those in big bags, intermediate bulk containers and under mechanical conveyance. And we've seen the high stress testing afforded by shear cells, which can give us an insight into the way that powder behaves when it is discharged from hoppers and silos. However, we still don't have the full picture, as we have little idea of how our powders will respond to the imposition of outside forces, such as compression and the throughput of fluids. Whether the conditions we're interested in are static or dynamic, it is the static behaviour of our powders to which we must turn now. In hoppers and silos, the forces acting upon powders can cause compression, which leads to arching and rat holing, both highly undesirable phenomena. In transport and storage, we can see densification, consolidation and de-aeration of our powders, which, as we know, can completely alter the character of our powders. In mechanical conveyance, compression of powders can drastically reduce the efficiency of powder transfer, or even stop it altogether. If we turn to pneumatic conveyance instead, then we may face issues as a result of the permeability. We saw earlier that the high permeability beneficial in hoppers may be counterproductive when using air pressure to relocate our materials. In fact, any time we're compacting our powders, whether by design or unintentionally, then the compressibility and permeability of our powders become of distinct importance. Fundamentally, both compressibility testing and permeability testing function in a similar manner. Both see the compression of conditioned powder samples at ever-increasing stress levels. In the case of the compressibility test, the change in the volume of the powder under those normal stresses is monitored and the percentage change reported. The compressibility is closely tied to cohesion, as cohesive powders are more likely to entrain air, which can then be expressed during the compressibility test. The permeability test operates in an almost identical manner, except this time we measure the resistance to the throughput of air which is being pumped through the base of the powder and out through the ventilation holes in the top of the piston. However, both the compressibility and the permeability of the powder are not fundamental characteristics, but emergent properties which depend upon, among other things, the packing state of the particles. So, although we can learn useful information in the results of those tests themselves, we can also look at what happens whilst the tests are progressing to get an understanding about what is happening in our sample at the particle level. Here we can see a plot of the separation of particles as a function of the normal stress applied. It's important to note that whilst permeability or compressibility are measured directly, each will closely relate to the average particle separation. So by looking at compressibility or permeability curves, we can infer the changes in particle position accordingly. In stage one here, we see the rapid reorganisation of particles as the normal stress increases. Whilst this will be an effectively random process, the overall trend will be towards closer and closer particle separation. At some point between positions 2 and 3, the particles will achieve a fairly regular organisation, but the spaces between particles will still not be minimised. Only at stage 4, when the rearrangement of particles cannot be altered any further, does the compression of the powder all but cease. Similarly, in the case of measurement of permeability, a flat line would indicate that the particle separation had reached its minimum. We can see then that both compressibility and permeability are inversely proportional to the particle packing efficiency. And so understanding these bulk measurements can give us an understanding of what is happening at the smaller scale. Here then, we can see just a few examples of different applications which might require different regimes of compressibility and permeability.
In hopper flow, as we've seen, we would like low compressibility, as this means that particles cannot pack more closely together under the high stresses of large amounts of material, which might lead to the formation of arches and, in turn, blocking of our hopper. In tablet compression and mechanical conveyance, when we are imparting large mechanical forces into our powders, compression is our enemy, as it takes energy out of the process we are trying to achieve. In fact, there are not many processes which require high compressibility. In general, powders with low compressibility are the easiest to work with. As I have already mentioned, high permeability is also usually a good thing. In hoppers, it prevents pulsative flow, and in both filling and compressive operations, it allows built-up air to readily escape. However, in pneumatic applications, particularly when powders are being transferred in the dense or plug phase, low permeability is usually preferable. What is important is that we understand when a certain property is of concern and how and when to test for it, and it is this process-wide visibility which powderiometry affords us. So, let's go back to the example process we saw earlier. Back then we saw how the various parts of the process required different measurements to understand. Well, now we can see that through using each of the different kinds of rheology testing, we can achieve those different test results and combine them to produce a complete picture of our powder flow environment. Shear cell testing allows us to learn about our storage and dispensing applications. Bulk testing can be useful here too, but also in conveyance, mixing and compression. We can look at specific energy, or mechanical interlocking and friction, to look at filling, pouring and dispensing. Our flowability measurements can inform us about the confined flow of our powders, for example in milling, granulation and conveyance. And aeration can give us information about low stress conditions in pouring, filling and coating. Overall, we can assess each individual part of our process using the appropriate testing methodology. So then, in conclusion, traditional methods can only take us so far. We need a more detailed inspection for a complex system like powders, and single output parameters can't give us the detail we require. Even where they are useful, they are subject to severe shortcomings and are not able to give us the kind of high accuracy measurements that we require in a modern process society. But rheology gives us that big picture. Direct synthesis of condition allows us to understand diverse conditions that are present in our powders, and multivariate analysis allows understanding of discrete elements of multi-stage processes. Physical and chemical characteristics can be related to process parameters via these rheological properties. That's all from me today. Thanks so much for listening and I hope to see you again later on in our webinar series. I see that we already have a few questions in the chat. Um, to start off with the first one, to compare flowability of two powders, do you use samples of the same weight or the same volume of product? Generally, it's, uh, it's, it's best if you can to use the same mass. So where we have powders which are of a comparable kind of density, then we would always match the mass between two different samples because a number of the different parameters that we output in powder rheology are dependent on that mass, whereas um, the volume uh, is something we try to control. So we match masses, and then we control volumes, and that allows us to, to make our two samples as similar as possible, so that whatever effects there are from, uh, from the, you know, the, the powder flow behavior, that neither the mass or the, or the volume um, are having too much of a strong effect on that. So because we can control the volume manually on the, on the, on the device, matching up that mass, that weight, is, the, is a, the most reliable way to go. Thank you. How significant is the effect of air trapping on powder flow? So yeah, uh, this is actually very significant, although um, it is highly uh, sample specific as well. So if we take quite a free flowing powder where we have 
uh, sort of weak surface forces, weak cohesive forces, this sort of powder will be really, really strongly affected by any kind of air trapping. Yeah, really acts like a lubricant uh, around those powder particles. Conversely, if you have a much more cohesive powder where those surface forces are strong, that air trapping effect becomes much less relevant to the airflow. And in fact, the aeration testing that we can do in powder rheology with the FT4, that is really what it's trying to assess. How significant is the effect of air on, on my particular powder's flow? So yes, it's very, very significant, but that is going to be highly powder specific. And that sort of th the strength of that significance is one of the things that you're, you're seeking to learn with an FT4. Thank you. Uh, the, for the next question, uh, what has more influence on powder flow, uh, like the type of the material or some sort of like physical effects like the size or the shape of the particles? Yeah, so this is really this is a really interesting question. So I think, you know, habitually most people look at um, you sort of particle size and shape. Now, they're quite easy to understand and they're um, their effect is quite easy to understand as well. So, I mean, you can say, well, you know, smaller particles, they pack together more effectively. So in general, they're more likely to sort of be a bit more resistant to flow, which is absolutely true. So I would say in a kind of general case, yes, those, you know, big features like particle size and shape are probably the strongest effect. However, things get more difficult when you're looking at, say, two powders who've got a similar size and shape. Then when do you start looking at? So then those sort of surface effects and things like that become much more relevant. So what I would say is, you know, on the, uh, sort of on the wide scale of looking across powder flow in general, it's those physical characteristics that are important. But when we start to look at things, you know, which matter in a sort of, you know, in our particular plant or our particular laboratory, actually it tends to be these these things like these surface effects, surface chemistry, that are having the most sort of relevant differences day to day, if that makes sense. Great, thank you. Uh, for our next question, so is there a way to measure the tensile strength of the powders? Um, so we have a, a number of different measurements that we can make um, uh, on the FT4, which are looking at, for example, the compressibility of the powder, dilation effects and stuff like that. So we don't have a direct method of measuring the tensile strength of the powder. However, we can begin to look into some of the parameters that are affecting that. So the FT4 in general doesn't measure direct physical parameters. What it measures is the effect of those parameters on powder flow. So whilst we wouldn't measure that tensile strength directly, we can see how the effects of you know, sort of powders of different tensile strength, how that is going to affect their flow. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple questions that we have relating to temperature. Uh, is it possible to adjust the measuring temperature? And then as, as a follow-up to that, uh, like what is, the, what is the highest temperature that, that could be achieved by the unit? So at the moment, um, sort of changes in temperature, are, sorry, you know, powders of different temperature are measurable on the FT4. They need to be um, heated separately, um, so just in a, in a you know, conventional oven or something like this. And we have a few different setups. So um, just with the equipment as it is at the moment, um, sort of, you know, fresh out the bag, uh, it can measure up to 40 degrees centigrade. And then with, a, um, with an elevated temperature base, that can raise up to 80 degrees centigrade, which covers most sort of uh, processed environments. But as I said, this is the, the, the temperature is con controlled exterior to the FT4, and then the powders are placed on the FT4 for measurement. It just kind of reduces the complexity of things a little bit. Great, thank you. Uh, so for our next question, how do you deal with powders that have some sort of fines in them that may separate or settle during the testing process? 
That's a great question. So actually the, the sort of segregation that you see with fines um, or, you know, or anything with a sort of wide particle size distribution really, that is one of the things that we can test for on the FT4. So we have a specific test that looks directly at that. You can also see the effect of changing fines on most of the other parameters as well. And this kind of, this brings it to a, to quite an important point about powder rheology in general, is that actually trying to use one test to look at any, any of these things doesn't really work very well. And it's only when we start to see uh, sort of the results of multiple tests put together that we can start to sort of pick up this sort of uh, bigger picture of our powders. And fines are a really great example of that. So if you can imagine uh, a powder which is, you know, it's got a sort of wide size distribution, so there's some fines in there, but they're really nicely distributed around the, uh, around the powder bed, then we might, for example, see uh, a sort of very consistent flow energy throughout the powder bed, and we'd see a very consistent compressibility and a very consistent permeability. But then as we start to process our powder or, or to test it, processing and testing are really analogous, we'll start to see those parameters changing. So the, the energy will no longer be consistent and you know, the fines maybe have moved down to the bottom of the material or something. So we'll see the energy throughout the powder bed change. So actually what we can do then is by, by assessing how each of these different parameters change, we can begin to, begin to build up quite a good picture of you know, where are the fines moving, how are they moving, how much processing does it require to sort of track that motion of the fines. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, things like fines are uh, the, the bread and butter of the FT4, really, and, uh, and they can absolutely be tested for. Thank you. Uh, for the next question, can the FT4 be used to characterize granules and pellets? How does the instrument handle uh, larger particles? Yep, okay, so yes, we absolutely can um, test uh, granules and pellets. I'd say actually granules are among the most most common um, materials tested. I should sort of be clear, when, when, when Freeman talk about powder, what we mean is anything from a few nanometers up to a centimeter or a centimeter and a half. So stuff that is more like gravel, really, or, or pellets than powder. So we, we can really cross this whole range um, of different particle sizes. And the way that we do that is by adjusting the combination of the blade and the vessel size. So our smaller vessels are 25 millimeters in diameter, and the blade is 23 and a half millimeters in diameter. So it's not that much clearance in between the blade and the vessel wall, but, but that gap in between the blade and the vessel wall, that's what determines what sort of sizes we can test. So then we have much larger vessels as well. We can go up to a 62 uh, millimeter vessel with a 48 millimeter blade, and that's allowing us to test up to sort of 10 to 15 millimeter particles. So um, really quite a wide range. Thank you. Um, this is more of an application-specific question, but which are the best tests to prefer, perform and study for inhalation powders as well as like capsule filling processes? Yeah, okay. So yeah, um, that is sort of application-specific and, you know, I, before I give an answer, I should, really, um, I should really comment that the specifics of that application and the specifics of the processes that are involved are going to be important there. So uh, whoever asked the question, I'm sorry, I, I didn't see whose name that was, um, feel free to get in touch um, with us directly on um, support at freemantech.co.uk, and I can give you some more specific advice about that. What I would say in a, um, a sort of very generalized sense, um, permeability is going to be really important uh, for anything to do with inhalation. So what we need when we're sort of, when we're creating that sort of that flow of powder in air, we need to be able to build some pressure up behind our powder, and that's only really achievable if we've got a fairly low permeability powder. We also need to look at things like the, the, the low stress cohesion, which comes from our aeration testing, because what we require in that case is the ability to, to, to mix the powder with the air. So this really 
um, determines sort of how easily the powder particles can be separated and then mixed with the air. So that aeration test is a great measurement of that. I would say actually sort of just coincidentally when it comes to, to capsule filling, those two are also really important as well. So when we fill our capsule, we don't want a material which is too cohesive because then it might not flow nice and smoothly into our capsule, depending on the sort of deposition technique we're using. Also, the permeability is going to be very important there as well, because if we are trapping air when we pour into our into our capsule, that air needs to be able to escape so that we're not you know, building up too much air inside the capsule, which is then going to prevent us from uh, from getting enough powder in there. So again, that, that uh, permeability becomes important, important. But in that case, we, we'd like a high permeability powder. Also, uh, for capsule filling specifically, um, specific energy can be very important as well. So this is this mechanical interlocking and friction between particles, which, as I said in the, um, in the presentation there, is really a description of the ability to form structures. That ability to form structures will in turn determine how easily that air is trapped. So that kind of ties in then to the permeability. But like, like I say, that it's, it's going to be quite process specific. Um, so if you do want um, specific information about that, feel free to get in touch anytime and I can discuss with you a little bit more specific to your own precise cases. Great, thank you. Uh, for our next question, uh, how do we handle moisture um, within our powders? Is, um, or is it possible to quantify the moisture content and how do we how do we kind of deal with the fact that uh, there may be some amount of moisture in our powder? Yeah, that's a great question and one, and one we hear a lot. So again, we can't actually quantify the degree of moisture within the, uh, with the FT4. Um, so again, like I said earlier, we don't measure um, the, the, the quantity of moisture, but what we can do is measure the effect of moisture on our powder flow. And it is a really, really important problem. So the first thing we can do is we can look at the effect on the flowability. So if you remember um, in, the, in the slides there, I talked a little bit about the sort of the flowability in confined spaces. Now that is going to be really, really heavily affected by that moisture level because what we see is liquid bridging between particles. Water's pretty much, you know, in low quantities, it's generally behaving like um, an adhesive between particles. So we're going to really increase that flow energy. But that's only part of the story because what you tend to see in most powders is that moisture that is there for 10 minutes and moisture that is there for three weeks have a very, very different effect on the powder. So we can also do some very detailed caking studies with the FT4 as well that allow us to investigate the effects of moisture over time. And the one thing that we see that I think a lot of people aren't expecting when it comes to moisture is that it doesn't affect the entire powder bed in the same way. So, for example, the, the material on the, on, on, at the very base of the, the powder bed might not be very strongly affected at all, but you might have a big, strong crust at the top of the powder. Alternatively, you might see different layers going throughout the powder bed and things like that. Actually, this is a really nice time to mention it. So later this year, um, I expect to do one of these webinars talking about this moisture and caking. So I recommend coming along to that if you can as well. Great, thanks. Um, as a, another question, um, is there any options for testing in like an inert environment or under uh, vacuum conditions for set samples that may be sensitive to like the air or moisture, as an example? Yeah, so you to do that, you would have to place the entire FT4 into your uh, environment. Now, that does happen in certain places, um, but again, obviously, it's quite dependent on the specifics of what needs to be measured. So um, I suspect ultra-high vacuum is not a very good idea with the FT4. Um, the, the components inside uh, wouldn't be rated for something like that. But if you just need to have sort of, you know, uh, controlled atmosphere, controlled moisture, controlled temperature, things like that, any kind of large environmentally controlled chamber is absolutely fine for the FT4. Um, thank you. Uh, 
for your answer. Um, so is it possible uh, for the FPO, FT4 to test like wet powders or samples that are um, kind of combined with some amount of liquid or like an electrolyte or yeah. some sort of solution like that? And, um, yeah. Yeah, so again, this is a question we get quite a lot. And it's, in a way, it's a funny question to answer, right? Because, um, you know, the sort of question usually comes, well, can I test wet materials? And the, the sort of intermediate answer is, well, how wet, how wet is wet? Uh, which is, ob obviously, this, is, this changes a lot depending on some materials. You know, you can, you can have one powder, you add 15% water to it, and it's still a powder. Some other powder, you can add 15% water, and it's it's like liquid now. So we don't have a – I can't say to anybody, okay, here's a specific moisture level you can test with FT4. However, the sort of slightly hand-wavy way that I would describe it is, well, if you've got a powder with some moisture added to it, yeah, absolutely, you can test it with an FT4. If you've got a liquid that's got a little bit of powder in it, it's a little bit more difficult. However, we don't really have a limit to what we can test. Um, it just sort of eventually, to the point where you're actually testing a liquid, the output parameters from the FT4 don't really make any sense anymore. But whilst you're still on that sort of very much a solid material with some added moisture, absolutely, the FT4 is really, really good at testing that. And uh, we have some pretty diverse um, use cases here. So uh, sort of slurries in battery manufacturer, um, dough and things in food and fruit, so things like raisins can be tested. I mean, yeah, I mean, so so actually, you can you can really have quite a moist material before the the FT4 is is beginning to struggle. Thank you. Um, uh, another question that came in was. Uh, so you've talked about a lot of different test methods on today's call, such as like dynamic, bulk, and shear testing. You know, can all the different techniques that you talked about um, during your presentation be evaluated on one instrument? Yeah, okay, so that's great. Yes, the FT4 is designed so that it takes all of these different um, methods and it can apply them all. Because actually, if you're missing any one of those methods, really you're not getting the full picture. Powder rheology really relies on this interplay between these different testing methodologies, these different sort of testing types. Because if you take a powder that you don't really know, you're not particularly familiar with it, not always going to be clear which aspect of that testing you really want to know about. So, uh, for example, we take the shear cell testing, which is you know, it's a really established and really effective method, but it only really covers this sort of high stress region. So if all you want to do is measure the flow out of your hopper, then yeah, okay, maybe you could maybe you could get away with just using the shear cell. Although even then you'd probably still want to look at your compressibility and permeability as well. But if what you're looking at is a you know, if you've got a whole process here and you want to understand your pro your, your powder throughout that process, that shear cell is just not going to be enough by itself. You need to be able to combine those dynamic and those bulk tests as well. So you only get a full picture by using not necessarily all of the individual test methodologies, but you need all of those those three different testing types, those dynamic, those bulk, and those shear, to get that kind of full picture. Great, thank you. Um, I think there's time for one more question. Uh, so we've talked a lot about kind of this moisture testing, and there's been several questions on that. So I'm going to kind of move away from that and kind of ask on the opposite end, um, you know, how do we deal with, like, the static uh, electricity w between our powders and potentially, you know, um, sticking to the sides of the, the, the walls of the uh, instrument? Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, there are kind of two questions here, really. Uh, one is, well, can we stop the static electricity causing us a problem, and the second is, well, how do we quantify anything like that? So I'm going to take the first one first, which is, well, if you're seeing static electricity uh, sort of build up in your powder test, you're most likely going to be seeing that in your process as well. So it may not even be desirable to try and mitigate that in your testing, because if you're seeing it in your process, 
you need to see it in your test so that you can quantify the effect of that static charge buildup. And that's exactly what we can do with the FT4. Again, we can see the effect of that static charge on our powder flow. And it's something we see fairly regularly. There are methods you can take to, to mitigate it, but in general what we find is that actually mitigation isn't, isn't really the ultimate goal. The goal is measurement of, well, what happens to my powder when it's becoming charged? And again, this comes back to this kind of uh, this flow energy um, that we see in these confined conditions, also in the unconfined conditions as well, where the static charge is essentially bonding either powder particles together or, or more likely you know, binding them to the walls of the vessel, to the blade and things like that. And that can really change that flow energy um, quite strongly. What's important to do, and this, this comes back to things like segregation, attrition, agglomeration, what's important to be able to do is to separate the effects of one of those things, you know, attrition, segregation, whatever, being able to separate that from your, the effect of your static charge. So the FT4, its job is to sit here and quantify the effects of these different phenomena and then separate them from one another so that you can understand, well, you know, how is this static charging going to be affecting me in my process? So we, again, we don't measure it directly. We measure, we measure the effect of that static charge on the flow itself. Thank you, Guy. That's all the time we had today for questions. Uh, if you didn't get your question answered, uh, we expect to hear back from us via email, um, and we will uh, answer all questions uh, that we've received during this webinar. And uh, thank you all for attending, and please uh, sign up for additional uh, micromorinics webinars in the future uh, as we discuss more interesting topics. Thank you.